a written statement from Harry as well. And clearly talking about this is not something that has happened in the past and is a done deal. And now we're trying to get, uh, you know, the truth out from 1995. But mm. actually talking about how the, the effect on the family, even today, still rippling on. Mm. What do you make of it? And what do you think the significance of what was said by Lord Dyson and indeed Prince William? I think the significance, as so often, is the cover up. Uh, the cover up here uh, involves basically two former director generals of the BBC, one who was in position at the time, uh, the other, Lord Hall, who went on to become chairman of the BBC after basically exonerating the organisation, basically, as he now says he shouldn't have done, but he trusted Martin Bashir at his word. Um, I think that's the problem. I mean, I think it, it's it's not just the BBC that does this. Most institutions, as your previous guest said, sort of try to cover over their traces if they do stuff that's that's wrong. But uh, this is this is an extraordinary level of dishonesty uh, by Martin Bashir that's been revealed. I think that if it was a journalist at one of our newspapers, the BBC would be calling for you know full uh, judicial-led inquiries, regulation of the press, and much more. This was a BBC journalist yeah. faking documents to try to further, um, uh, you know, worry and, and and make more paranoid an already very unstable, sadly, woman as Princess Diana was at the time. And I think it's it's an extraordinary level of deception. And if it was anything, anyone else in the media or press. Uh, the BBC would be calling for heads right now. Oh, and wouldn't they just? I mean, this, is, this isn't, again, it is a very clear point made by Prince William. This wasn't a rogue reporter. And everyone's no. going, this is absolutely shocking. They knew it. There would have been people around him who knew it at the time. Certainly by 1996, they did an investigation. They knew it. The cover-up continued again and again and again. Even this has only come out not because of uh, this Dyson report. The Dyson report has only happened because of uh, reports in the, in the press last year as a result of Freedom of Information requests quest which of course were, were were you know fought against for long periods of time um is it is it possible that we now are going to see um uh, repercussions of this being far wider than a, a maybe heads rolling civil cases criminal cases all of which by the way costing millions of pounds that will come out of your or my uh, taxpayer uh, funded license fee um but but are there also other repercussions in terms of the trust for the BBC generally and its role as a state broadcaster, its 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 role uh, in in a position where they they are able to you know basically <laughs> insist that you know, we we go to prison if we don't buy the we don't pay the tax to pay for the BBC. I, I think what will actually happen. There are lots of things that could happen. There are lots of things that you and I might want to happen. I think that what will happen is that the BBC will successfully claim that this was. Uh, one person in the past, you say it wasn't just a rogue reporter, they will, but they will succeed in getting away with that claim. They will succeed in saying this is a long time ago. Why dig it all up now and much more? Uh, but as I say, I just return to this point. I mean, this is this is an extraordinary level of deception that went on. And if it had been any member of the press other than the BBC, yeah. we would be getting, uh, you know, unbelievable judicial inquiries and calls for the press to be reined in. And people would be talking about the toxic environment in Fleet Street and much more. Indeed. I'm just breaking news. The Metropolitan Police uh, have announced they are going to assess uh, the contents of Lord Dyson's report and uh, decide whether or not any criminal proceedings will uh, continue or will start. Yeah, I mean, I, whenever the the police do something like that, I always sigh slightly. You know, they, they they quite like taking up investigations that somebody else has done and then announcing they're going to have a ten year investigation of their own into it, and before you know, everybody's dead. So, uh, I, I wouldn't put too much hope in that. Interesting. Let's let's talk about. Well, you know, you mentioned you know before long everybody's dead. We we we, we spend a lot of time these days. Uh, dealing with uh, people who are long dead, anybody who's had a statue to them uh, ever put up in this country seems to be coming under uh, big uh, question marks these days by the, the Woke Brigade. Mm -hmm. Yesterday we had a, a, a sort of a victory of sorts, but certainly a victory for the wrong reasons. A statue of Cecil Rhodes uh, was, uh, that was decided that it will remain at Oriel College, Oxford after Don's decided it would take too long and cost too much to take it down, despite the fact there had been an independent commission uh, which had uh, backed the decision to remove the statue this after people had objected to the fact that there was a statue to someone who in their view perpetuated uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the views of colonialism and racism and goodness knows what else. Now 
I'm glad that the, the statue is staying, but probably for the wrong reasons it's staying. Mm. What did you make of that decision and, and indeed the entire process and the arguments we've had over the last few years about whether or not we should remove statues of anybody who doesn't match up to our exacting standards of today? Yeah, the Cecil Rhodes statue uh, is almost a sort of blueprint for this. It's been going on for about 10 years now. It started because uh, some South African students, the leader of whom was actually on a Rhodes scholarship <laughs> at Oxford. Uh, basically, I think this bit wasn't understood. We're auditioning to begin political careers back home in South Africa. And so they sort of whipped people up and pretended that they just couldn't bear walking past this statue, which you really can't see very easily at all from street level. They couldn't bear walking past this, that it made it oppressive, that it was a symbol that Oxford was racist and a lot of other things that were just completely untrue, insincere and fallacious. Uh, but, you know, students are particularly vulnerable to people making these claims and can easily be derailed into thinking that, you know, if you took down this one statue, all bigotry in the world could be solved. And so it became a campaigning issue for students at Oxford and elsewhere. And it's very interesting. I, I don't at all blame the Dons uh, of Oriel for saying we, we just we, it is taking up so much of our time. It is such a diversion. We don't know how we can make the uh, applications to get it off the building, given that we're a listed building, and much more. I think they're completely right, because this argument has gone round and round in recent years. Yeah. Uh, it has been very unenlightening, by the way, incidentally, about who Cecil Rhodes was. The campaigners to bring down the statue almost always say things that are not true, or they haven't bothered to check up about him. They have not bothered to contextualize history, for students, they display an extraordinary lack of intelligence or curiosity. Um, but, but, but they make these claims. And actually, uh, uh, we didn't have the debate that we should have had about it. We had a very one-sided campaigning debate that ended up being taken over last year by BLM activists. And, uh, and, and I just, I lament apart from anything else, the unbelievable level of incuriosity that's been displayed. Yeah. Last year, when BLM were, were, were uh, campaigning around this, one of the BLM people said that, that Cecil Rhodes's inheritance and money should be used, for instance, to set up a scholarship program so that people could go to Oxford. You know, what, you mean like the Rhodes Scholarship? It's like um, the most famous scholarship in the country. Most famous scholarship in the world. Uh, actually, they're, they're, by the way, they've been, for the last 20 years, they've been known as the Rhodes Mandela Scholarships because Nelson Mandela put his name to it as yeah. well in which, a very is, magnanimous is, and generous gesture. Rather telling. I mean, it is extraordinary, isn't it? And, and again, you know, with the to, to ride, you know, with Winston Churchill and others, and just not understanding, you, you haven't even got the right to, to have that march, let alone deface that statue. Uh, if it wasn't for to Winston Churchill. It's, it's, it's quite painful to watch. Um, just just finally, very briefly, if you would, um, the freedom of speech, where the, the, the government has said they want to sort of basically in, enforce the right to freedom of speech and, and to end no platforming and censoring going on in our universities. Um, do you think they're going to succeed in that? Um, I, I wish them well, but it's going to be an uphill task. And the reason is that it's it's not just legislation, of course, that, that's needed. It's a culture change at the universities. The, the letters page in the Times yesterday was very revealing. Prominent academics, but it was the few academics who, who do try to speak out, who wrote to the Times and said, you actually, the evidence is if you're a Brexit supporter, for instance, and you were in university teaching professions, the evidence shows you would not share your voting preferences with your colleagues. So it's a cultural change that needs to happen in our universities. Our universities now have most young British people going into them. In that situation, this is no longer an elite thing. And therefore, a left wing elite cannot capture these institutions solely for themselves. Absolutely. Douglas Murray, it is always such a pleasure speaking to you. I always know that my listeners are just cheering you on, a voice of sanity and reason in the darkness. Always so good to talk to you. That's Douglas Murray. Uh, of course, his most recent book, absolutely brilliant, The Madness of Crowds, uh, absolutely must-read book.